I'll start off by saying that um, a 10 minute presentation is amazing when you know exactly what you're doing mm -hmm. and when you have more questions maybe than answers it can um, feel like a really big challenge. So I'm going to try to distill where I'm at and happy to talk about it more later. Um, the title of my project is Social Equity Through Inclusive Education and my background is as a special education teacher in the States. Um, as a special education teacher I realized that I became a really good teacher just in general um, for all students regardless of what their label is so that's sort of my orientation coming into this project um, next. Thanks. Um, so sort of similarly um, and I'm a PhD student um, doing my dissertation research here as well so um, in general the discourse on education in the US in Chile internationally has been one that goes from worrying about access, right? How can we get um, all students into schools? How can we develop the educational, the literacy rate of a country? Um, and in the 20th century, you see that sort of in a progression from compulsory education. Then once you're educating everyone, you have special education to deal with kids who are different. And um, the discourse then also in, in countries dealing with issues of racial integration, indigenous integration, becomes one of integration, right? Let's get these kids who are different into the systems. But as time goes on, the discussion or the discourse becomes one more about inclusion. In large part, I think, thanks to critical theories such as disability studies that question the notion of exclusion for whatever reason. So once you start talking about inclusion, inevitably the issue becomes equity. And what's meant by equity in the special education discourse in the United States can be conceptualized in horizontal and vertical terms. So horizontal equity is the idea of having equal access to the same schools and classrooms for all kids, but since we're coming from the special education background, particularly for kids with a, a disability. But vertical equity is the idea that, okay, so once you're just physically in there, what happens with you, right? Vertical equity is the idea of having access to educational supports and services in the setting that allows for an educational benefit. Because if you're not benefiting, what's the point, right? However, so, I, so that comes from the work of special education, and special education in, in many ways is, fu is fundamental to these discourses that we now have on inclusion more broadly. However, um, leading researchers in the field claim that the international discourse about inclusion, especially outside of the US, breaks with the special education tradition by interrogating exclusion of all kinds. So there's kind of this movement to get away from special education when we talk about inclusion. And there's a tension there because the, the words and the language overlaps. Next, thanks. So um, in the comparative discourse on inclusion, we have in, in, in general, more recently, and in, across the world, the word inclusion becomes associated with the removal of barriers for all learners. Okay. In the US, the word inclusion is still very much associated though with special education and the idea of having kids with different learning needs in the same physical setting for most of the day as kids without um, special learning needs. In Chile, um, there's, and this is why I initially chose Chile, because there's a lot of policy language around inclusion, right? But really in Chile, what, we t what is associated with special education is called integration still more so. So we have things like the 2015 inclusion law, which um, was supposed to be adopted this year and was supposed to allow for the admission of sort of blind admission into public schooling, um, which would mean that you would have more mixing regardless of labels in classes. Um, but that hasn't really come, come to bear. There's been a lot of pushback if you follow the news around the inclusion policy. So for my research, I'm having, I'm now in a position where I have to choose, like, am I going to focus on integration, schools that do integration, integration programs, um, or do I, or do I try to sort of associate inclusion and integration, inclusion here really being associated with social class more than ability. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a, a complexity in a mess. And then, 
just to sort of further illustrate the complexity and um, the discourse on integration in Chile, and this is a bilingual slash Spanglish presentation, if you haven't noticed. Um, in, in Chile, it, special needs are classified into two big groups, permanent and transitory, okay? We don't, we don't do that in the U.S. You can see that the transitory ones are much, they're more transitory ones than permanent ones, and the transitory ones start to kind of get into muddied waters when you see that they have to do with socioeconomic and cultural deprivation is an actual term. Interfamilial violence, teenage pregnancy, drug addiction. So these things wouldn't be usually considered a disability or, or dealt with in special education in the states. And this gets into the idea of the, of the social construction of disability and the ways in which it's tied to other factors like socioeconomics. This crazy diagram is just sort of meant to represent the policy context that I'm trying to sort of understand and navigate through. So if we think about a, just a big pool of marginalized or underserved or vulnerable youth, right? Some of those will be classified then under the criteria that we just saw as kids with special needs, yeah? But because kids with special needs might have a transitory disability or a permanent one, there's gonna be a sort of intersection between the kids that have a transitory disability and these other kids that we're trying to serve, right? Low SES, indigenous, immigrant kids with a different ling linguistic background. So, so I personally like believe that the most promising pedagogical practices for teachers kind of happen in having to deal here and also here. Um, because you have to adapt yourself to a wide variety of needs. But the language about inclusion in Chile, the policies that all sound really nice, are really sort of dealing only with this kind of camp. Integration, which is actually a program to sort of implement inclusive policies, is really kind of squarely just sitting over here. So, where do these kids end up? Kids with identified special needs, and also I'll, I'll speak in a second about the, the bigger pool. Kids who have identified special needs will end up in either a municipal school, which is a free public school, or a um, public-private school with an integration program, okay? Because I don't know if everyone here knows, but there's free public schooling, then there's public-private for which you have to pay a fee, right? and then there's private. Most people in the country are educated in the public private system. How am I doing on time? Okay, so um, in, in these, actually can you go back one Mason? In these schools there's gonna be kids with special needs will either be fully included in a gen ed classroom, which means they'll spend most of their time in, a, in the classroom just like any other regular kid um, but they will get either specialized support inside the classroom or maybe out. That's full inclusion. That can go all the way to just social inclusion, which is I'm, I see you for recess and the rest of my day I'm in a separate resource room. Um, kids also with identified special needs may end up in a public or public-private specialized school, which like don't, don't really exist that much in the state, so a school just for kids with special needs. And there are three private special schools in the country. So the modalities in here, you might think at first, oh, it's a special ed school, so like, you know, whatever, they just teach those kids. But there's incredible amount of variability and variety within any given disability or label, right? So it's interesting to sort of explore here, what are the modalities that are being used in these schools, and what could these modalities potentially teach um, teachers who are working in these? Does that make sense? One other really interesting point, and now you can go to the next one, is that these special schools stop after primary or basic education. So there's a really big disparity the world over in attainment levels of kids with disabilities and kids without, but especially in Chile, which has a really high um, attainment rate in general, the gap here for secondary education between kids with disabilities and kids without becomes really large. Here is also, I think, an interesting context to study inclusive practices because this is where kids with special needs are going to be mixing with kids from low SES backgrounds, kids who are immigrants. And so the instructional strategies studied that, that are going to be used here, I think, um, 
it could just be really interesting to sort of compare these or just look at them um, in, in tandem. So sort of to conclude, there's a conceptual confusion related to integration and inclusion. So when I also made this proposal, I proposed to adapt an international survey of inclusion and one of the biggest barriers so far is like, am I gonna ask about inclusion or integration? There's a conceptual confusion and that has real implications for teacher practice and also student learning. The existing research on teacher practices around inclusion in Chile suggests that there's a lot of work to be done still. People think that differentiation is discrimination. Right, so people might hesitate to like adjust, individualize in their classrooms because they don't want to be seen as discriminatory. Um, there's a limited empirical research on effective instructional strategies for inclusive settings. Um, both students with special needs and just including marginalized or underserved students. What research exists tends to reaffirm the notion of inclusion as placement. So going back to those ideas of horizontal and vertical equity, a lot of the empirical research that exists will sort of boil down to an idea of like, how much is the kid in the classroom? And as we discussed, that's not enough. Special need diagnostics don't necessarily prescribe instructional strategies as much as maybe we wish they did. So that's another thing to sort of think about. What, how much do you actually get from some of these um, special need categorizations? Um, and there's learner variability within those categories. So what works for one student may not work for another with the same identification. And conversely, what works for a student with an identification might also work for a student that doesn't. So I have these um, research questions which are currently very much under construction. Um, but where I'm, where I'm going, I think, is number one, what are the perspectives and practices of teachers and potentially school directors in charge of the inclusion of students with special needs. What are their perception of students with special needs? What are educators' perceptions of their own knowledge of special needs, inclusion, integration? What are perceptions towards inclusion, integration, and special needs? I know these sound similar, but they're different. Um, what practices do educators report utilizing to include students with special needs? And then how do these vary by school type, by integration program, by teacher factors? And student factors. Um, I have a whole bunch of other like interesting data and figures but um, I'm not going to get into them unless people have questions about them because it's complicated. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, thanks for paying attention. <laughs>to study this within Santiago or also in the regions? So that's, that's still a big question um, because if I look at specialized schools, like schools for, that are dedicated to certain kids with disabilities, 91% of them are in urban areas. So, um, and there's a big attainment gap. If you look at kids with disability, there's a big gap between the attainment of kids in rural areas, kids in urban, consequently. So, um, I'm still not sure. Originally, I had also thought about potentially looking at Magallanes, which is the first area that implemented the inclusion law. Um, and there's also the new public education law, which is being implemented in the Araucanía, which could make for an interesting um, research site. So I still don't know, but good question. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, that was also kind of my question. Um, but so when you were talking about um, the differences between the primary schools and the secondary schools, do you see kids going from the special needs primary schools into secondary schools? It's, it's there, the, I haven't really mm -hmm. seen like figures on that and, or, or research on that. Um, it's clearly a lot of them don't, right? Because, because of the attainment gap. Um, the other just interesting piece that I didn't get to mention is that the integration programs in public schools are kind of voluntary, so which again is compl is complicated um, to explain, but or and understand. But so if I'm and there's no public tran there's no public transportation for schooling in Chile, as I understand. So if you are in a specialized school in your neighborhood, and let's say your your disability makes it maybe more difficult for you to go to a school further away that has an integration program. So there could be a lot of issues there.
Um, something you could talk, you mentioned there had been some pushback about the inclusion program in Chile, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. So there's been pushback uh, against the inclusion law, which is a, which is a major overhaul of the education system because it was designed to eliminate profit in public and private subsidized schools. It was also designed to eliminate admission practices in those schools and make admissions um, uh, free of fees, free of testing, free of interviews, which would in theory really kind of like open the doors um, to, to who comes in. One other interesting and not often discussed piece is that the inclusion law also had a provision making it difficult to expel kids from schools, which is a major issue in special education in the states. We, we've started to talk a lot about the school to prison pipeline, right? The idea that once you push these kids out of schools, they end up in delinquency. So, um, but that law is really designed to address the sort of class segregation of um, the school system. And people have pushed back because they don't want admission to be lottery based. They want to be able to choose where their kids go to school. They want to be able to pay to ensure that their kids get, get, get good schooling. So, so there's been pushback around that. Around the integration program, it should be noted that kids that have special needs come with a three to four times more of a of a subsidy from the state. So, so in the municipal schools, the, the totally free public schools, there's an over representation of kids that have special needs because it's a way for the school to get financial resources. So there's yeah. more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So have you looked at all into like the teacher education programs in Chile and do teachers feel prepared and like they, they're able to handle integration with I mean how big are their classroom sizes? Yeah, excellent question. So there is a lot there is research on pre service teachers, um, attitudes towards inclusion and the, the research in Chile goes with the research internationally, which suggests that people are like, Yeah, sounds good. Mm -hmm. I would like to do that, but either they just don't feel prepared before they go into the classroom with actual strategies, which by the way applies just to teachers in general. Right. Um, or once they get into the classroom, they just they, they struggle with feeling like they don't have enough time, they don't have enough resources, etc. The question on class size is a good one because the average class size in Chile from an OECD report from 2017 that I saw says 28. Per 28 kids per class, mm -hmm. but the averages are always really misleading. Yeah, some schools bad. have one kid, some mm -hmm. schools have 4,000 kids, yeah. Yeah. So, so there's that. And one other really interesting piece is that the integration program stipulates that there should be no more than seven kids with an identified disability in, in a given classroom, five of transitory type, two of permanent type. So there's that stipulation, but that doesn't always end up mm -hmm. happening because it's right. not so easy to regulate something like that, and anyway, so so does that kind of yeah it does. Thank you. Just one more time. Okay. Do you, okay. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks. The separation between transitory type and permanent type is Chile unique in including transitory types into special ed. That's or, a good question. So I don't fully know. But I will say this, like, the idea of special ed in the states is that you get out of it. The idea is you're going to get whatever your disability is, say you have dyslexia. You're always going to have dyslexia, the thinking goes, but you'll get services that allow you to develop um, coping mechanisms, skills, so that you no longer need to qualify for special education. However, in practice, special education in the states is something where once you're in it, like you're probably in it forever. Um, so, so there's that. So it's kind of cool to see that here because that goes with the idea that disabilities are socially constructed, are time, like mm, temporally dependent, if I can say that. Um, so I think that's actually kind of a pro. But um, yeah, I'm not sure about other countries and how they, how much they usually utilize that distinction. But it's really interesting to me. Thanks for asking. Thank you again, Chris. Okay, thank you.